Hello Lockdown Diaries Day 20, uh, a bit chilly down here tonight, um, so I'm going to try and get through this one pretty quick. Uh, it's just about the Carne de Passage, so for many people this won't really be of that much relevance, but for, but for anyone who's thinking of a transcontinental uh, trip, you know, when restrictions end, then this kind of is your golden ticket to adventure, because without this uh, you won't be able to get very far. Just to quickly rattle off the countries that, that currently need it, uh, so Australia, uh, Indonesia, Thailand is recommended, and then India, Pakistan, Nepal, Iran, Libya, Egypt. They're the ones that really still rely on it or, or request it. It's kind of an antiquated document uh, and it's essentially designed to stop you selling your vehicle in a country and also to allow easy transit. So instead of arriving at the border and then thinking that you're going to need to import it officially and then export it when you leave, it essentially allows you to transit the country without having to make any official or any long-term commitment of, of importing and exporting that vehicle. So it's to allow free movement of vehicles effectively. It's issued by the FIA, which is a global organisation, and then it's administered at a, at a country level by different organisations in each country. In the UK, it used to be administered by the RAC, which has now changed. They, they now a company called Cars Europe. I've just got it up there. I don't know if you can see it. CarsEurope.net is the administering company now in the UK. This is the carnet that I got when I rode back from Australia. So Sydney to London. And I got this one in Australia. And this in Australia is issued by the Australian Automobile Association. Now, technically, I should have sent this back at the end of the trip, but I still have it. So I shall post it straight away at the end of this video um, but this is the document this is what people slave over and pay a lot of money to get um, I'll just quickly show you the contents of it so it makes a little bit more sense but it starts as a front page which is just you know usual blurb in, in French and English and etc signatures name of the person it's being issued to the, the issuing authority so in this case Australian Automobile Association uh, and then you've got all your vehicle docu uh, details in there, so uh, register number, uh, net weight of vehicle, year of manufacturer, uh, VIN number, uh, chassis, engine number, uh, value of the vehicle, value of any spares that you're carrying with you, and then signed and stamped by the issuing, or issuing authority. And then a page in it looks pretty much like that, hopefully you can see that. So it's, it's split into three parts. At the top, you've got a little stub there that retain, that stays in the book. And then in the middle, you, and at the bottom, you've got two identical panels that you tear out. When you enter a country, uh, the uh, the border guard, the customs guy, will stamp this and keep hold of this, this bottom half. When you leave the country, the, the customs guy will take that middle section. And then the stub there will always be in place. And it will be it'll be stamped. If I can just show you, it'll be stamped there when you enter the country and there when you leave the country. So it's proof that you've you've officially, you know, brought the bike through on the carne and officially taken the bike out on the carne. The idea again is to stop you selling the bike. Therefore, somehow, if you don't have a completed exit stamp, you will be tracked down and charged the the duty fee, the import fee on the vehicle that you no longer they. They, they would allege you no longer have. So it's just a, in a lot of senses, it's a formality. But again, without it, you're not going to get very far. Some countries completely get it and they do it day in, day out. So they know what it is and, and uh, what to do with it. So when you, when I shipped air, air freighted from uh, Bangkok into Kathmandu, the Nepalese customs people they knew exactly what a carne was, they knew where to stamp it, they knew what I needed to be given and what they need to needed to take. But when I crossed from East Timor into West Timor, which is effect effectively into Indonesia, the border guard in the, in the middle of the, the jungle border check didn't have a clue what a carne was and he had to you know call people over to, to figure it out and uh, you do your best to try and point him in the right direction. Because the worst thing is, is, is having an improperly completed uh, carne de passage because that would give you issues at the other end. I mean, there's many countries in the world that now don't deal with it, they don't use the carne, they just have their own sort of system. 
Uh, and I think, I'm trying to think which countries. Um, I think South America and, and Africa, they just, they've just got their own policy in place, which means that you don't have to get this, that you can just lock up at the border and go through their uh, system of doing it. Um, the problem with the Carne de Passage is that it's kind of expensive uh, to get. Uh, the cost of it is based on the value of the value of the bike. So the more expensive the bike, the more expensive the Carne de Passage. How they calculate it is very convoluted and what they've essentially done is looked at the countries that you need a Carne for and then allocated them a percentage value of a percentage multiplier of the bike's value. So for Egypt, it's 400, no, 800% of the bike's value, which they use to calculate the sum. For, I think, India and Pakistan, it's 400%. Um, each issuing agency in each country uses that figure and calculates a figure differently. So there's no universal fee that you could look at for, you know, wherever you are in the world. You have to go to your local issuing, issuing agency and see how they do it. Um, and then they add it together, so you pay about £250 for the actual book, and then this multiplier of the, of the countries that you're going to go through to, to get to a figure. To try and make any sense of that, um, this document, for me, on a um, $1,700 bike, going through countries that had a 400% uh, value on them, so India, Nepal, etc., I paid $950 for this. As a, as a sort of bond, and at the end, if I send this back, I would get $250 back. So this document essentially cost me $750 on a $1,700 bike. Now, if you've got a £10,000 bike or a $10,000 bike, multiply that by as many times. So in theory, you'd be looking at losing $5,000 on a, on a $10,000 bike to ride across. So that's what puts a lot of people off. Certainly when they're looking at coming down through Africa and you needed the 800% um, carne to come through Egypt, and then if you're travelling on a £10,000 bike or you know a £20,000 Land Rover, the cost of the carne was, it could be incredible. Now the problem we had in England was that the RAC stopped issuing what was kind of an insurance indemnity against that, that fee. So you used to be able to take almost like an insurance policy out, which was a fraction of, uh, of the total amount you were due to pay, uh, and that would cover it. So it, it made it cheaper and more affordable. Then they, but then they stopped that and made you have to leave a bond in a secure account, I believe that's how it was done, to the, to the complete value. So you know, maybe you did have to put £8,000 into, 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 you know, into the security that you were going to bring the bike back, and then you get some of it back at the end. But... You had to stump up at the front end, such a huge amount of money that it just put people off. Uh, and as a, as that built, and the and the as the anger grew in the overlanding community, because essentially the RAC became gatekeepers of overland travel. If you didn't have the financial means to pay such an extreme amount of money, you couldn't do it. For a while, people were going to ADAC, which is the German. Uh, agency that issues the Carnet de Passage because they were accepting applications for f from the U from UK residents, but uh, the English side, the RAC, quickly cottoned on to that and then somehow managed to be able to stop the ADAC being able to do that because obviously they were losing a ton of money. So there was a lot of anguish and there was eventually a petition that removed RAC as the issuing authority and handed it over to CarsEurope.net which looking on their website makes it incredibly vague as to how much the carne is going to cost you. Uh, they have reintroduced the, the bond, the, insur the insurance indemnity against it, so it has reduced the cost. But f for overland travel through any of those countries mentioned, the first port of call when trying to budget for it is to ring carseurope.net or AAA, Australian uh, Automobile Association, if you're, if you're setting off from Australia, and find out the cost of the car name, because that could be a huge deciding factor in your route, uh, in the value of the vehicle you take, because don't forget it also, you have to list your spares and parts and things, so that could add up to quite a considerable amount of money. Uh, and it's, it's really the reason that people do straight across Russia, because you don't need a car name if you're there. Same across into America, uh, North America, Canada, 
uh, down into Central America and South America, you don't need a carne there either. There was a while where you know you ring the RAC up and say, hey, you know, I'm going to do South America, and they'd recommend a carne, but it was never mandatory. So they would obviously try and get you to have one and charge all that money when you didn't need one. And at the borders, you would you were able to do it. I've never travelled South America, so I don't know exactly how it was done, but it was done without the carne quite successfully. Same with most of Africa. Um, it's a shame because it, it, it holds people back shipping their bikes to Australia for a road trip, for example, uh, or to New Zealand. Because uh, whilst you can technically import and export your bike properly, say if you were staying there for a long time, a year, it might be worth doing that. In most cases, you need a carne. And then not only have you got the cost of the shipping, then you've got the cost of the carne, and then, then it's no longer worth it. And then you look at the cost of renting the bike out there, that's expensive. So actually, if you're going to do Australia, it's better just to ride, to fly in, buy a bike, ride, sell it at the end. Uh, it's why travelling to America on your own bike is actually cost effective because you haven't got to pay a carne. So you can ship your bike to America, you know, say £2,000 return, which is still a lot of money. But if you're doing a longish three or four week trip there, it's cheaper than renting. Certainly if you're going one way coast to coast. So that's the carne de passage. This really is... Uh, it's almost like a bygone era document that still is in existence, is still holding on by its, uh, by its claws and, and still making it difficult for the overland community to travel with the impunity that they wish they, uh, they, would wish they could. So this is mine, I should send it back, I really should, but I, I did like having it as a, as a memento. And you have to treasure this, you know, if you lose this you're in trouble, uh, if you change the engine, for example, and the, the engine number changes, then you're in trouble, you have to get this reissued. It's also only valid for a year. So if you're, if you're traveling for longer than a year, then you have to reapply and have it renewed every year. So it's quite a, uh, a binding document. It's quite a uh, restrictive document. But as I say, without it, you know, when you're turning up, you're flying into Kathmandu and you haven't got a car needed passage, you're in trouble or in trying to get into Pakistan, etc., you're in trouble. So that's it. The Carne de Passage. I've just wrote down a few links that might be worth it looking at. So the Carne there. So if you're UK-based, uh, carseurope.net is where you get some information. Now, this is a fantastic resource, the overlandingassociation.net. They've got an interactive map which you can click on every single country. And it will show you, do you need a carne, don't you need a carne, uh, what other restrictions are in place or what other ways around it are in place. So it's, it's user updated uh, and it's got some active forums and it's just got loads of overlanding information on there. So if you are planning a big trip, a, overland, a big overland trip, go to overlandingassociation.net because it, I'm sure it will have the answer there, whether it be about the carne or visas or shipping. Um, also, I also find if you use a good shipping agency, I, I use Motor Freight in the UK, uh, and they've got knowledgeable staff. So if you're wanting to ship to South Africa, for example, they'll know whether you need a carne or whether there's exclusions or exemptions or ways around it. Same with Australia, for example. Same with America. They'll they'll be able to help you with whatever paperwork you need, wherever you're shipping. Uh, the particular bike so yeah for me here was the issue you know getting uh, well Indonesia you need I needed it in Indonesia uh, I think they used it in Thailand I don't think it's mandatory in Thailand but they did you they did stamp mine in Thailand uh, and then Nepal when I landed into India they used it there I remember being taken into an office dusty old office and uh, you know they serve you tea and, uh, and a man in an old sort of colonial uniform goes through the process and speaks some english and quite a pleasant exchange really pakistan i've got to say when i crossed the border into pakistan that was all quite a good formality they knew the procedure that had purpose built brand new customs house there on the wagga wagga border that was actually fairly painless uh, and then into china i mean china bless them uh yeah <laughs> authority beckons or administration beckons when you cross into china uh i mean it's it's kind of efficient but they take they take uh, take detail to the nth degree. They uh, check my memory cards and my laptop for anything, and uh, they want to check everything. Bless them. Uh, and then that's it. So that's it. You don't need it west of there. So as you can see, going through Mongolia, you don't need it. Uh, Russia, you don't need it. America, you don't need it. So that's it. The Carne de Passage. 
paperwork for going around the world. But essentially, once you've got that figured, you've figured out what visas you need for which countries you're going to pass through, that's your research done. That's the main block of your research. And also looked at maybe the you know the crossing points, how you are going to get the the ferry, the shipping ferry from Darwin to East Timor. Once you've got those three figure those three main elements, shipping, documentation, i.e. your carnate and your visa sorted, you're halfway there to planning your trip. So that's it. Good old England. That's where we'll be all this year by the looks of by the sounds of things. Domestic adventures, eh? Right, take it easy. Over and out. Bye.